stands. I'm Mark Goldbridge and this is your latest news for Manchester United this Monday morning. And there's so much to unpack. Still people talking about the penalty drama from yesterday. I'd file it under don't care, to be honest. That might be a bit harsh, but I'll explain why. Also, ex-players going in on the manager. It was a bit of a weird day yesterday and there are plenty of rumours around from... People opening their gob, players telling him this, ex-players saying that. I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's probably Ten Hag's biggest problem at the moment is the pile-on that he's getting from people who are just saying stuff subtly, who I think should just open up their gobs. Uh, because it's very, very clear to me that there is a movement to remove Ten Hag. And a lot of you this morning are looking at the Deserby news and saying, oh, I'm not watching this, I'm not interested in this. But it's a news show, people. And Deserby uh, yesterday... There was at least three stories talking about De Zerbi and Ineos' interest in him. I don't want to be talking about this. I want to be unpacking the weekends. I want to be looking forward. Got Fabrizio Romano on the show. That's all going to be about transfers. Don't worry about that. But look, we're here to talk about the news. Uh, De Zerbi is the latest manager that Man United and Ineos are very interested in. Um, one down. By the looks of it, it looks like Graham Potter is going to Ajax. So that's a positive. That's one mistake that can't join Manchester United. I would certainly say that De Zerbi is an improvement and Potter and Southgate, but I still feel he's not the right guy. So we'll start off with that because we've got a lot to talk about this morning. Uh, Sal says bring back Beth. Don't worry. Beth was on the last show last night and she was on the morning show this morning and she'll be on again today. So don't worry about that. Uh, should have got her on the morning show. Actually, I feel absolutely rough today. Uh, I don't know whether it's pollen or what, but um, Mark thoughts on the young centre back played really good game and mainly was going to be world class as Paul. Look, I, I can't lie to you uh, as I, as I offer up the deserby story. Um, you know, it's not just me. I'm not going to name who else, but we're all getting stuff from around the club that that, that Ten Hag's d done. He, you know, he, he, I did a video last week. Um, we, we are getting stuff now. Whether I whether we believe this stuff it, it, it is is um, you know I I don't you know bloody Rio Ferdinand stood at a train station and said Qatar was getting the club and it didn't happen. So. You know, ex-players for me, I'm a little bit like, you know, how close are you to it? I think Gary Neville's close to it because he's working with Ineos on the um, rejuvenation of the area around Old Trafford. Um, he's very clearly Ten Hag out, in my opinion. There are others who are saying Ten Hag's done no matter what. Um, there are others saying that the players don't like him. So I think this is Ten Hag's biggest problem, really, is that uh, Sky saying that Potter rejected Ajax, says Robert. Well, there we go. He's back in the race then. He's, and McElvis said it as well. So Potter's back in the race if he's rejected Ajax, which is, um, which is worrying. But look, Ten Hag's biggest problem is even when you get a good result against Liverpool, even when you get robbed against Chelsea, so many people have made their mind up. And yet, we know the mitigating circumstances around injury. I mean, it's interesting. Robert McCormack's just reminded me there. No one's talking about the fact that Scott McTominay wasn't on the bench yesterday. I mean, is, is that another injury? Is that an, yet another player that's out injured for Manchester United in a key game? So, you know, you can say what you like about McTominay. He's scored important goals this season. So, um, you know, uh, the injuries go on. The uncertainty from the, from the leadership and ownership goes on. And uh, I think that, as well, Ten Hag still has the best win ratio of any manager. So, you know, and yet there is still this pile on. And on top of that, you mentioned Kambwala, Mainu. These are players that Ten Hag has brought into the team. These players never would have touched grass under Jose Mourinho, by the way. He's just not that sort of... Mourinho would not have used Mainu and Kambwala. And there are managers out there that would not have used them. So as much as people criticise Ten Hag... I wish there would be some acknowledgement that not every manager would throw in an 18-year-old into holding midfielder away to Everton and then trust him every week since. Not everybody would throw in Kambwala at centre-back against Liverpool. Like, they wouldn't. They'd do something, you know, Mourinho would put McTominay at centre-back. Oh, he's injured. I'll put Casemiro at centre-back. Like, there is never really much appreciation for that in the mainstream and also in certain sections of our fan base that what he does with the youth, not many managers do. So if you do sack Ten Hag and a new manager comes in, you know, 
I don't want Southgate anywhere near the club, but I don't think Southgate's the sort of guy that would do that. Oh, but he played him in a couple of friendlies for England. Yeah, because it's a bloody, it's a, it's a PR hit. Would he do it when his job's on the line? That's when you find out who's really about the youth. Because Ten Hag's job's been on the line all season, and yet he's thrown these kids in. Because he believes in it. And, and, and I think that's really important. Um, Alex says, happy birthday for yesterday. I think we should just give Gary Neville and Carragher the United job since they know it all, says Alex. Well, I want to talk about some of the things that Gary said in a moment. But let's talk about the Deserby story because this is news. Um, I'm also going to talk about the penalty. I need to get a bit of a poll going on here as well. Um... Do you th uh, let, me, uh, let me say? Do you think it was a penalty? I suppose the next one is: Do you care? I don't really care, uh, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so, look, yesterday morning before the game, there was a couple of stories in the Sunday papers saying that Man United really appreciates uh, uh, Deserby and he's of high interest to Ineos. Um, look, if. As some people say, Ten Hag's a dead man walking and he's gone. And we'll ask Fabrizio at lunchtime about this because he said last week there's a high chance he'll stay. Um, there is very conflicting stories. And that's the first question I'm going to ask Fabrizio at lunchtime is, are, is Ten Hag likely to be our manager next season? Because Fabrizio will be well sourced and he won't want to say something that's not going to happen. There are a lot of rumours going around, some of them from ex-players, some of them from within the club, some of them from players, that Ten Hag's a dead man walking and he'll be gone no matter what. Um, whether that's right or wrong, if he does go and we have to, you know, take it that it could happen, then where do Man United go next? Well, as I've said, Southgate is a very real opportunity that Ineos want to progress because of Dan Ashworth. Um, another manager would be Graham Potter, who has apparently rejected Ajax. And then you've got De Zerbi now, who, again, has a Dan Ashworth link because um, Dan Ashworth... Although, had Dan Ashworth already left Brighton? When they got Deserby, he must have done. Yeah, he must have done because Deserby came in. Yeah, I think Dan Ashworth had already gone, but it's still a Brighton. Uh, it's still Brighton, isn't it? As we know, the Nice coach is a disciple of Deserby as well. As I said to you before, uh, the current Nice coach, which is owned by Ineos, he is a disciple of Deserby. So the connections are there: Brighton, Ineos, Nice, Deserby, um, and this is apparently now a manager that Manchester United would look at. I, I watched. Brighton play against Arsenal on um, Saturday. Lots of good players. Crap. Um, I've seen them get stuffed by Roma, stuffed by Fulham, stuffed by Luton. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't get why you would spend £15 million, because that's the release clause for De Zerbi. In fact, it might be 20 I don't get why you'd spend 15 to £20 million to get De Zerbi out of Brighton. And then spend 10 sacking 10 Hogs. So you're spending about £25 million to remove 10 Hog and bring Deserby in. I mean, that to me would be absolute stupidity. So, regardless of whether you think he's better than 10 Hog, or regardless of whether you think Deserby is the guy, somebody explain to me why it's worth 20 million quid, 25 million quid of an outlay to pay his release clause and sack 10 Hog. On what? One good season last year. Uh, hello? Our manager did well last year as well. So if we're ignoring De, De Zerbi's been shit this year, why are we ignoring that Ten Hag's been shit this year? And why don't we just stick with what we've got for another year rather than spending the money on De Zerbi? And that's sort of my mic drop, really, because Brighton haven't been that good this year. They play, a, they play a good style of football, but the foundation was there to do that. And also, I think the people who say, well, De Zerbi plays a better brand of football than Ten Hag, but he inherited a club that played football. Like... Potter's Brighton played football. So you walk into a club with players that can play football and a structure that buys players that can play football. Brighton have arguably got the best recruitment in Europe. They buy players with the right mentality and the right footballing traits and they all fit into the system. If De Zerbi came to Man United, his biggest problem straight away would be he's got people on two, three hundred grand a week who can't play football the way he wants to play. And that's the problem that Ten Hag's got. And that's the problem that Rangnick had. So I just think we'd be stepping into the mistake that the Glazers made year after year, whereby you sack a manager, you bring a manager in that you want to play a certain brand of football, and then that manager realises he can't do it, and then the club won't sell those players. This is the problem that Ten Hag had. This is the problem that Rangnick had, whereby you're coming in to play a brand of football, and then the Glazers say, but you can't sell these players that can't do it. I said, um, I said on Twitter yesterday that um, after the game, 
Um, Cause I saw some people were giving Bruno like a seven, eight out of 10 for the performance yesterday. And I gave him a five. And I don't care, look, I really don't care if you give him a 10 and you give him man of the match or you give him a two. I don't care, it's the whole point of it. I don't know why people get the knickers in a twist about player ratings, right? That they're your ratings. Like, it's what you think. When people clip you up and go, I can't believe this guy gave him this. Well, believe it, I did. I I'm not going to lose any sleep at night with you slagging off my player ratings to try and get retweets. It doesn't matter. It's been going on for years. Some people even take them from other games to pretend I said it about them in that game. Um, but I don't think Bruno played well yesterday. I thought, I thought he did what Marcus Rashford did against Man City. Marcus Rashford scored an absolute banger, but his overall game was poor. So why is it any different for Bruno? You know, Marcus Rashford scores a, ba scores a banger against Man City and, and everyone gave him a five. So Bruno scores a banger against Liverpool and, and, and he should get man of the match. Why are we not being fair? I don't think Bruno played well yesterday. But what a bigger point, and you might not be ready for this, I don't think Twitter was ready for it, is I said last night after the game, there needs to be a conversation that goes beyond the manager, that on Bruno Fernandes, he is 29. He's not going to change the way he plays football. He he will keep hitting those 40-yard Hollywood passes. He will keep doing. He will keep not creating chances for the striker. He will keep running around everywhere and giving everything. And he might find the form of 18 months ago, but he is never going to be Odegaard, De Bruyne or any other number 10 that's creative like that. He's never going to be that. So my question last night was, can Man United, considering he will be here next year and probably the year after and probably with the captain's armband and therefore never get dropped, can Man United actually compete with Man City and Liverpool and Arsenal next year or the year after with Bruno Fernandes as the number 10? That's the question. And these are the questions you need to ask yourself instead of wandering down the path of we need to change the manager. Because if you bring De Zerbi in or you bring in Nagelsmann or whoever, they will not have the freedom to remove Bruno Fernandes because that's just the way this club works. Can you make Bruno Fernandes win a title with a Man United side? I don't, you know, I've not necessarily thought it through, but on, 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 on the evidence of the last few years, I think you need a magnetic number 10. I think you need a number 10 that is always thinking about keeping the ball and, you know, delivering and conducting. And I don't think he does it enough. I don't. Deserby stock has dropped. He'd be another Ten Hag, but not as good, says Ray. If Deserby's breaking chairs on the bench at Brighton, imagine what he'd do if he watches these players downing tools, says Tun. And with the issues we're having at left back, do you see Alvaro Fernandez gone in the summer, says Ruben? Uh, yeah, I do. I do. Mark says, um, the pen in my eyes is a no, but the law states that that, that was their contact. That's a yes. It doesn't state that they the play stick his leg there to get the penalty. Sorry. Um... Um, yeah, well, I can talk about the penalty in a moment. Uh, Chrissy Boy says, Morning, Mark. Hope you're well. Love the show. Always getting me through work. Hopefully we can kick on, have a strong finish and uh, a trophy to show for it, says Chrissy. Uh, De Zerbi called out Tony Bloom in an interview after inheriting a solid Brighton squad. I don't like his attitude. Ten Hag in, players out, says Max. Uh, Alex says, happy birthday for yesterday. Uh, thank you very much. I think I've read that one before. Uh, Bruno Slander is so disrespectful. He's carried the team for a long time. He deserves more respect. A bad Bruno, Bruno performance is a good performance for a lot of players. This isn't Player FC, says 4x4 FM podcast series. Mate, I've got nothing wrong with that. I I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. Uh, you know, I've got no problem with that. Um, I don't think he's been playing well for months. And I think you have to call that out. Um, I don't think anybody should be above criticism. Um, you, you know what? I think Bruno Fernandes... Oh, I'm just going to say it. I think Bruno Fernandes' recent performances um, actually do reflect the team. And maybe there's something in that. The captain reflects the team. It's sporadic. It's chaotic, it's ill-disciplined, and there are moments of brilliance. And I think when you look at Man United, and Gary Neville said this yesterday, he said that um, Man United are, you know, basically uh, uh, an odd bunch uh, who rely on moments. They can play well for 15 minutes, like we saw in the first half, and then they disappear for half an hour, and then something will happen, and then they'll come back again. And I think that is Man United... 
And I think that is Bruno Fernandes now. Bruno Fernandes is not a 90-minute player anymore. He's in and out of the game. You know, there's, there'll be 20 minutes of bad passes and then suddenly he'll have a good 15 minutes. And I think that, 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 that basically reflects Manchester United. We don't put in 90-minute performances. Um, we are very sporadic and we are very reliant on moments. And, um, you know, I, I'm a thing is, I'm a big fan of Bruno Fernandes. But, you know, what well, I, don't, I don't do player FC. I, I don't see the point. I'm a big fan of Casemiro. He was rubbish yesterday. And if these players have a problem with that, well, you know, what they... I, I, I'm not here to be, you know, Bruno in the Bruno Fernandes supporters club. I'm, I'm, I'm a Manchester United fan. And if the players have a problem that, with that, then it only evidences why they shouldn't be here. And some of them do have a problem with the criticism. And I don't care. I just genuinely don't care. You know, I gave Rasmus a five yesterday because he gets no service. I think I think he... I mean, I'm going to talk about it on the podcast later, but because I want to talk about Hoyland and Haaland and what happens to them when they don't get any service. Because last week, Roy Keane called Haaland a League Two player but he didn't get any service. And and, and it's funny how we criticise strikers when they don't get any service. Rasmus had no service yesterday. People are saying, well, partly that's his fault. He's not making the right runs. Mate, he could run to fucking Tesco's and somebody wouldn't give him a fiver to get him a meal deal. Like, they don't look for him. Whether he's making the right runs or the wrong, wrong, wrong runs, the crosses aren't coming into the box. The only one yesterday that I thought maybe could have anticipated a bit better was the Casemiro header across the face of the goal. Casemiro's a holding midfielder and he's putting in a good, what was a was a decent cross. But um, no, look, you have to be, in my opinion, critical of any player if you want Man United to be successful, and which is why I posed the question around, um, around Bruno there. But on the manager situation, it's going to keep happening. It's going gonna, it's gonna to carry on and on and on and on. Um, and I think Ineos have either made, either made their decision or they haven't. But if they're thinking of spending £25 million to bring De Zerbi in for, for Ten Hag, I think it's a massive risk. I really, really do. Assuming that he gets tired of being rung through the dirt at Barca causing massive injuries, would you like to see Javi take the Bruno role, says Rabel. No, not really. Um, no, I wouldn't. It should be Mount, Mainu and a new centre defensive midfielder next season, says Robert. I agree with that. Uh, Nevin says we won't spend 20 million to get Dan Ashworth as uh, director of football um, in earlier in ahead of an important summer. But we can spend that on unnecessarily changing the manager, apparently. Um, and Elliot says the amount of clips that are circulated on social media about the penalty is insane. It doesn't matter if he dives or whatever. Stand on your feet. Aaron Wambasaka says Elliot. Uh, good morning. Thank you for being a legend, regardless of how United play, says Jay. Um, thank you very much. OK, well, let's have a look at this penalty because this is amazing to me. And this is why I love this community. So do you think it was a penalty yesterday? I don't really want to be talking about this, but let's do it because we're a community and this is what we do. Uh, we're going to talk about Casemiro in a moment. We're going to also talk about Ten Hag's biggest problem and a few other bits in the news this morning. But let's talk about this because we had a big game yesterday. Um, do you think it was a penalty? 50% of you say yes and 50% of you say no. I think you can establish the truth there because we're Man United fans. And if we're 50-50 on a penalty, it's not a penalty. Because we, you know, if I asked you about the Chelsea one on Delo, with Delo and Madueke, 90% of you would say it wasn't a penalty. And I'd be with you. On the penalty, I'm the same as you. I'm sort of like, I don't really care. I, don't, I, don't, I genuinely don't care. And people will say, well, you're not a United fan then. But no, I, I, don't, I don't wear red tinted glasses when there's a reality. There's a lot of people who want to sack the manager. There's a lot of people who want to sell first team players. If we were red tinted glasses, we wouldn't be wanting to do that. There's a reality to this fan base, and I think you have to be honest at times. That, that I, I think it's a penalty, and I, I don't like Anthony Taylor. I think he's a crap, crap referee. I really, really do. But as soon as I saw him slide tackle, I thought that's a penalty because I, I was like, "What are you doing?" As I said, Ned Stark lost his head. What are you doing, and why are you doing that? Now I've, I've watched it back a few times. I've seen it on social media. The ball, he, the foot he goes to tackle with, he doesn't get the ball and he doesn't get um, Harvey Elliott. But you're watching it in slow motion, people. You're watching it in slow motion. In real time, it's a lot quicker. And the most important thing is, Aaron Wambasaka hasn't got one leg. He's got two. And as he misses the ball, the momentum causes a scissor situation where Harvey Elliott's in between it. And therefore, contact does happen. And Harvey Elliott, quite rightly, feels the contact 
and exaggerates it. And he goes down. And that's a penalty. Because wan is on the ground, out of control, with momentum, with his back leg, going into Harvey Elliott. And that's why it's a penalty. And that's why it didn't go overturned. If Anthony Taylor hadn't given a penalty, VAR wouldn't have overturned it and said it was a penalty. But as soon as Anthony Taylor gives it, VAR have got no reason to overturn it because they look at it and they go, well, it's reckless and he does actually make some contact. And that's what happened. And that's why for me, it's a penalty. And we can all moan about VAR, but we're, we're, I, I'm the first to moan about VAR. But this is where we make VAR win because on that, I think they've got it right. On Thursday, it was just downright corrupt. But with that one, everybody's watching it in slow motion and saying it's not a penalty. Put it into real time and you'll see the momentum of wan flies through Harvey Elliott because people are just looking at the first foot. But there's a second foot and there's a whole body coming in behind it into where Harvey Elliott is stood. It's a penalty. I think it's a clear penalty. And I think if, you've got, if you want to blame somebody, you've got to blame the stupidity of the tackle. But honestly, I don't really wake up this morning angry with wan -Bissaka. I thought it was stupid. I really did. But I thought we would have been very lucky to get a win out of that game. Really lucky. Um, I think a point was just about justified. On the balance, Liverpool probably should have won. Um, but I think a point was about all we deserved and I'd love to have won the game. I'd love it not to have been a penalty and I'd love Liverpool fans to be going on and on and on and on about it. But I'm really not that, you know, there's more important things to worry about. And um, I just think, I think with United at the moment, we've got Bournemouth on Saturday. We need to win that game. We've got Coventry the weekend after. We need to win that game. We need to win as many games as we can between now and the end of the season with those players that are willing to put the shirt on and fight for this club. And I tell you what we did learn yesterday as well. You know, I think Anthony really needs to start against Bournemouth with Ganacho on the left. We're a better team with Ganacho on the left. This is not I don't I don't even want to mention the R word on this show. I think it gets mentioned too much and I don't want to mention it. Um and he might even be injured for next Saturday anyway. But on purely footballing ability, we're a better team with Ganacho on the left. And I think Anthony's the best option on the right at the moment. Those two players need to play. With a full week of training, you know, I think Anthony might have been tired after the Chelsea game. I don't know. But that's the way you've got to go. Um, because we're so much better with Ganacho on that side. As a lead supporter who loves the show, please do not go down the same road as we did with managers. Anyway, good luck and hope to see you next season, says Vegan. It is a penalty because they called. However, penalties like that shouldn't get called because Jones initiated the contact. Aaron wan should have known better, says Daniel Farr. Look, as soon as wan goes to ground in the box for a slide tackle, you, you, you reap what you sow. I think that's it. Ten Hag doesn't have the guts to sub Bruno. Rashford, forget about selling them with Ten Hag as manager. And £25 million is nothing when Ten Hag and co. can waste £400 million on the likes of Anthony, says Sherlock. Okay, we'll just move on from that one. Watching the old firm is... I don't even know what the result was in the old firm game. People keep talking about it. I've not. I'm, I'm an, I'm, I've just completely missed it. So Ross says, watching the old firm as a neutral and the penalties given in that game are even worse. Why are United players wasting their careers by downing tools, says Ross. Um, we could sack Ten Hag, says Zeno, but it will reduce the funds for a new centre-back, a centre-forward, and a centre-forward. Keep Ten Hag. We can do several clear-out, especially Rashford. I've had enough of him. Ten Hag in, says Zeno. And I think two centre-backs who can play at super high line and an upgrade on DM will be transformative to this team. Let's see what Ineos do in the summer, says Rory C. And assuming that he gets tired of being run through, they've done that one. Um, it was a three-all draw. Thank you very much, George, Kyle and everybody else. I don't know why I'd missed that one. So, look, I'm going to close the penalty uh, poll to move on to another one, um, just to see where you are this morning. Um... I, you know, we do this a lot, but it changes a lot. I think after the Chelsea loss, there were 60% of you who were Ten Hag uh, in. So let's see where we are this morning. These are the only polls I care about. You remember when we, can you remember when it was like Qatar or Ineos and 90% of you wanted Qatar? And then there was, was it The Athletic or something? A paid to skip subscription had a poll and they said 60% were, were Ineos. And it was just like, no. 
you know, that's not right. Uh, there were both penalties. Chelsea's by the rules was a penalty as well, unfortunately, says Sticks. Um, Casemiro on his worst day is still a better 10 times than McTominay will ever be. We need to prioritise to sell the bottle jobs who've been there for years, says Julian. And um, yeah, we look, you, you look, you know what? I think that yesterday we did really, really well to get not beat. Um, I very rarely go against us in a prediction, but I couldn't see a result. Um, we did really well not to get beat yesterday. Wherever you want to put the praise, we did really well to get not get beat against Liverpool. Um, it's chaos football from Manchester United. And I wanted to touch on a couple of things from the media, actually, because it is news. Um, obviously, we had that ridiculous comment from Gary Neville before the game saying that he's not buying Man United's injury crisis as a reason for not performing. And you look at the bench, you've got two teenage defenders who've never played for us before. You've got Cambuala at centre-back. Maguire's are the only fit senior centre-back. You've got Casemiro, who's basically done in the midfield. You've got Wan-Bissaka at left-back. I mean, we've conceded two penalties that have cost us two wins in the last two games because we haven't got a left-back. But yeah, the injury crisis has got nothing to do with it. So to get a result yesterday with, 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 with everything, I think was quite good. But... Just to go on to the media stuff, um, there is this weird, I would say, obsession with Man United style of football. We've seen Carragher do it, Neville's spoken about it, radio talk about it all the time. What's the style of play? It's chaotic. And I just sit there and I think most Man United fans do. And this is probably why we do quite well as a community, because I think people come here for a proper conversation. Like, there are Ten Hag outers here, of course. There are people that would sell Bruno and Rashford, etc., of course. But there is a real conversation that goes on um, about the reality. Like, Ten Hag's biggest problem is the same problem that Ranić had two years ago. And again, only on this community have I heard this. And they'll eventually hear it and go, we need to write an article about this. Or someone needs to say it on Sky and take credit. Get Carragher in front of his screen. Like... We are so reminiscent of Ranić two years ago, April, May, Greece, because people are basically saying, I don't want to be part of this mess. Um, and, you, 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 you know, Ranić could not get these players to play the way he wants to play. So Ten Hag's biggest problem at the moment is, and I saw it yesterday, he's got nothing like his best team. He's got players getting injured by the day. And he's also got players that are, you can see that they've checked out. So you're you're trying to achieve things with players that you just can't trust is the bottom line. And it's exactly what happens to Ranić. So, but it's not being spoken about in the media. It's being spoken about by you, but it's not being spoken about in the media because what they're talking about is, oh, have you seen how many shots they've conceded? Or... Oh, it's just so chaotic. It's a mess. It's an odd, you know, they're an odd bunch. But there is no, there is no acceptance that, as to why it's happening. And it's, and it's happening because we've got players that are checking out. We've got loads and loads of injuries. And we don't have people who can play in certain positions. So the chaos certainly can be described. And what I find really funny is that when Newcastle won against Fulham at the weekend, there was loads of people going, it's amazing they've gone and won at Fulham with all the injuries they've got. You know, that's a threadbare Newcastle. You know, they've had, they were dominated by Fulham, but they found a way to win at the end. That's character. And then, but with United, you're expected to go and beat a really good Liverpool team with a threadbare team. You know, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Um, and I think that's Ten Hag's biggest problem for the next few weeks, because... You know, I look at I look at Casemiro and I I don't know whether he's got an injury. I don't know whether he's he knows he's leaving, but that was awful from Casemiro yesterday. Like the the, the jogging he was jog, jogging back. Now he's either jogging back because he's knackered or he's jogging back because he's injured or he's jogging back because I don't know why. But um you know, Casemiro's a big problem. Um the defense is a massive problem and We've said it before, you know, if you want to look at how we can play, then look at the 60 minutes against Wolves when he had his best team out. We played really, really well. We played very high up the pitch and we pressed. We we can't do that at the moment. So we're almost 
we'll, we'll see it next Saturday against Bournemouth. We're going to have to play basketball again. We're going to have to go... They'll have a go at it. I mean, we might we might get beat by Bournemouth is what I'm trying to say because we can't go to Bournemouth and park the bus. We'll have to try and play. And if we try and play, they will get opportunities. So, you know, it's going to be very interesting. Hi, Mark. Love the United stand and Man United news, says Billy. Anthony Maycock, thank you very much for... Mayock, sorry. Thank you for being member, member for 24 months. Bruce Lee Gaming says, happy birthday for the other day. I'm struggling this morning, you know. Um... Exclusive Gem says the fan base wanted to sack Solskjaer but want to keep Ten Hag. Make it make sense. Yeah, I'm not answering that. Bloody hell. You need to go and do some research, mate. There's about 20 reasons why it's a very different scenario. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, what is it about Neville constantly kissing opposition's arses like he did with Liverpool yesterday? Didn't he used to play for United once, says Bernie? I, 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 I don't really understand... You know, if you're 10 arg out, just say it. I think it would... Um, I think it would... Um, it would make a lot more sense if he just came out and said he's 10 arg out. Um, because some of the comments yesterday were just very, very odd. Um, and it seemed to me, as somebody who's capable of doing it, and I, I try not to do it, um, he's obviously being watched by millions. It seemed to me like he was just trying to implement... And he does it on Twitter with his politics, I felt that like Gary Neville yesterday was trying to imprint his feelings about the situation onto millions of watchers because I thought the injury thing was complete and utter horseshit. And I think to say that in front of millions of people is trying to influence people to your weird take that the massive injuries we've got are not a reason for why we've been bad this season when quite clearly everybody knows they are. And it seemed to me that Neville yesterday, from listening to some of it, surprisingly, when you think about how he had Solskjaer's back so adamantly, seems to be very anti Ten Hag. And it just comes, whether he is or not, he um, he he, um, he he just comes across as that. So yeah, I, 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 and that's just my opinion on it. But maybe, maybe look, he, 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 I saw a clip of him reacting to the Bruno goal, and it seemed very subdued. But then the main new one, he was really happy about it. So, you know, it's not all uh, doom and gloom by any sense. But um, look, I, there's a projection there, isn't there, of change? I think people get very excited about change as well. You know, it's like Christmas, isn't it? You might have nice toys and stuff, but it's Christmas. I'm going to get new toys. I just think that there are a lot of people, um, you know, out there that just like the idea of change. And uh, I I understand that, you know, change can be really exciting, but not all change is good. And I don't think that in this situation, I still am yet to see any uh, prospect of change that makes me go, yeah, that's a good idea. I don't see that uh patrick lynch welcome to members club funnily enough talking about change 78 percent of you are ten hag in so you know man united should be taking notice of this because it does fluctuate um but it was 60 percent after chelsea where we didn't deserve to lose and we did uh, and after a draw against liverpool that's gone up by 20 percent to 80 percent so you know that's a that's a big indication i think of I think I think where the fan base is at the moment is that, um, look, and I said I'd keep the receipts from Thursday night. You know, I know people who work on YouTube, on websites, journalists, who after that Chelsea result, they changed tact and they went, I can't deal with it anymore. I think it's time for a change. And I thought, idiots, you've gone, you've gone, you've gone with passion there, idiots, because it only takes a result against Liverpool and you'll want to come back again. If you're going to go Ten Hag out, you've got to stick with it. And I think some of them did, and I've got those receipts. And if they want to try and come back, I think you can, but, you, you know, you've shown yourself to be a bit fickle. Um, I think a lot of people are like me who are Ten Hag in. It's not necessarily because I think Ten Hag's the right guy. I think we'll find out next year, and I think he has to be given next year, but it could go wrong. I'll admit that. You know, the Bruno thing's very interesting, I think. The Rashford thing's very interesting. They'll still be here next year. But I would give him next season because we've got to clear out. We've got to clear some of these players out. We have to do it. I mean, look, I had, I had that moment yesterday where I think that um, 
Uh, NAU says, why are you not on the football fill-in anymore? Uh, I was never going to be on today because um, I've got things going on. So uh, I will be back next week. Um, but the I've only missed two weeks anyway. Bloody hell, people get so dramatic. You know why I'm not on the football fill anymore? Um, I've left. I've left. I had a big, big fallout with uh, Ben Foster about the quiz. I was convinced Jamie was cheating. So I said, fuck your quiz and fuck the football fill-in and I'm off. And, and you can you, 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 you can take that as well, Watto, you big un. Um, and I walked out. Um, that's not true. But look, um, yeah, going back to what I was saying there, I think it's um, I think it's just as I think when when we've changed the manager so many times, I'm absolutely desperate that we don't do it because I'd like to try the path less trodden. I'd like us to try something else. I'd like us to try and remove some of these players. Um, and stick with the manager and see what happens in year three. Because I think with any with any club, year three is always the most important year. Year three was the year that Mourinho got sacked. Year three was the year that uh, Oli got sacked. Most managers will have year one where they um, you know start the build, year two where they understand the build, and then year three where they have to deliver. And I think that when especially I mean look. <clears throat> It's not always the case. I think whoever takes over Liverpool won't need that because it's a club that's ready to go. I think if you take over Brighton, it's a club that's ready to go. But when you're taking on like what Klopp did with Liverpool or when you're taking on what Arteta took with Arsenal or when you're taking on what Ten Hag took on with Man United, you know, the worst ever Premier League Man United side, then year one has to be the start of the build. Year two has to be understanding the build and then year three has to be delivering on the build. And, and I think it's a three year project. So um, I think that makes total sense to me. But also, I think if we keep Ten Hag, we'll see mass clear out of players this summer, which is well overdue. And one of those players, I think, has to be Casemiro now. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm always open to changing my mind. I just don't do it flip flop. And I don't think many of you do. But changing your mind is absolutely fine. Fine. I mean, I get people showing me clips from 18 months ago saying, um, you know, you, you, you said, for example, I'm trying to think of something. You said Maguire's total shit and will never put in a good performance for Man United. Well, he just played man of the match. And I'm like, it's 18 months old. Like, it's an 18-month clip. It could be eight weeks old, but it doesn't matter. You can change your opinion based on evidence. And I think with Casemiro... We need to replace him because it's not just yesterday. It was Chelsea as well. And it's other games this season. He's not mobile enough. He's not mobile enough for that role. I look at people like Basuma and Declan Rice and Rodri. And you need mobility in that position. And Casemiro's on £300,000 a week. So we're paying £300,000 a week for somebody that's not mobile enough for that role. So he, he, he has to go. Sadly, he has to go. And I like Casemiro. And look, nothing I would like more than for next week, he suddenly finds that mobility and it was an injury problem. I'd love that. But, um, you know, as things stand at the moment, I'd be cashing in on him. Look, a lot of people say we need to cash in on, um, on Marcus Rashford because of his wage. You might not be wrong. But I think it's time for Casemiro to go as well. His crapping, his crapping was passing yesterday. His passing was crap yesterday, says C-Mac. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. But we, you know what? I love this community. I love that we talk about things in a, in a proper way. And we will disagree. There is, you know, there are people out there on mainstream, maybe on YouTube. I don't watch it. And I think they play a game. I think they play a game of... Oh, will this be? Will will I look bad if I say this? Or oh, you know, they're almost like playing to the crowd. You know, sitting on the fence, grey, whatever you want to call it. You know, I, I've changed my opinion on Casemiro in the last two weeks. So what? So what? I think I'm right. I might not be right, but I think I'm right. I think we need to cash in on the summer because he's not mobile enough and he's very expensive. And I wish him all the best. And he's been one of my favourite holding midfielders of the last decade. But I think it's time to move him on. If PSG came in and said there's £75 million for Rashford, bye. Off you go. You know, somebody just asked me that. I've not just It's not just come out of my head. Um, if, some, if PSG came in and said £75 million for Rashford, I'd say sell. 
um, because I just don't think he's a good fit for Man United at the moment and I don't think we're a good fit for him. Um, he played badly yesterday. He wasn't missed when he came off. He wasn't missed against Chelsea. We were better without him, both when he was off the pitch yesterday and against Chelsea. We were better without him. He's on a lot of money. I think he needs a change. I think the people around him are dragging him down. I think the brand has become competitive towards Manchester United's brand. And I think where we want to go, I don't think he can adapt to it. So I think it would be best for everybody. And I'd wish him all the best. And if he went to Ra if, if Rashford went to PSG and started scoring goals, I'd be so happy. I'd be so happy for him. I don't really... Di Maria Tevez is about it. I, I don't... You know, when Nicky Butt went to Newcastle, when Phil Neville went to Everton, I want these players to do well. I, I don't... There's a, there's a, there is a time, there is a season that comes to an end. And I, I think it would be better for everybody. It wouldn't be, you know, if Martial goes and plays elsewhere, I really hope he does well. I really do. I, I don't hold these players a grudge at all. It's about what's best for Manchester United. And I think people take it too toxic. You know, McTominay should leave. And if he goes to West Ham, I hope he does well. Maguire should leave. And if he goes to West Ham, I hope he does well. If Lindelof leaves and goes and plays for AC Milan, I hope he does really well. I don't want them to do badly. I just think we need to move on as a football club. And um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I really, really don't. What I'm looking forward to do, uh, I think we, I think Fabrizio on a bit earlier today. I think he's on at half 12. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Don't miss it. I really want to get into some of the transfer stuff because the best way to counter the shitty manager uh, rumours, I don't want another week of manager crap. I really don't. I think as a community, we can create a movement and... I really want to get into the transfer stuff. It's it's August the 8th. We will be talking to agents. We will be talking to agents of players that were looking to move on. Things will be starting to happen. If PSG were interested in Rashford, that sort of thing could come out. You know, it, it, the manager situation, there should be some sort of resolution there as well. This is what I want from Fabrizio at half 12. I want to get into all this stuff, definitely. Um, talking about movements as well. I've just got to say, you are absolutely incredible. When I checked yesterday, and I'm not really into all this sort of stuff, this book, this very book, <clears throat> which many of you have pre-ordered already, has, um, has gone into the top 200 on... What are you talking about August for? It's, it's April the 8th, not August the 8th. Uh, yeah, we haven't lost three months. Part of me, wishes, part of me wouldn't mind it. Um, this book here... Football According to Mark Goldbridge, Get In, um, is available for pre-order now. You can scan the QR code with your camera phone. You can get a signed copy from WH Smith. You can pre-order the Audible and or on Amazon worldwide. A lot of people worldwide were saying, I can't get it from WH Smith. Get it from Amazon. Um, we're in the top 200 already for that. Um, is incredible. So um, please do keep getting it. Um, you are making a movement here, as we do with this community all the time. Uh, you're really going to enjoy the book anyway. There's loads of stuff in it. Um, but uh, please keep supporting it and pre-ordering it. You're making a real, real difference. And uh, it's going to be amazing. So thank you very much. Um, it's a huge book. It's got loads of stories in it, Mustafa. Many stories that uh, you won't know about. So uh, check it out. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. As usual, we've got, we're back very, very soon. We've got Fabrizio on at half past 12. So we'll see you then. And um, thanks everyone for watching. McAlvis says, it all depends on the summer. If there isn't wholesale change in the squad this summer, then Ten Hag is a sitting duck next season. And I, I agree with that. I just think if we're going to sack him, it should happen next season, not this summer. And uh, Talal says, considering the remaining matches of Villa and Spurs, I strongly believe we can still make the Champions League. <laughs> It's always nice to have a laugh, Talal, especially on a Monday. Take care, pal. I'll speak to you all very soon. Don't forget, Fabrizio Romano at half 12. Thank you very much. You can order globally, Geordie. Scan the QR code with your camera phone. I'll drop the link in the description. Um, you can order worldwide with Amazon, yes. All the links are there.